Father, we come before your throne this morning with heavy hearts as we think about our brothers and sisters, people we've never met, but people we'll spend eternity with. They come from various backgrounds and walks of life. They come from different cultures. They speak in other, in other languages, but they are just like us. And this morning and daily, they face pressures that we know nothing about, experiences that uh, we have yet to experience. And so in some ways, we don't even know how to pray for them, Lord, but we know that their desires like ours are to stay faithful to you. They desire to be strong in the midst of terrifying situations. They care about their children. And they want them to not be afraid. And this morning I pray, Lord, for their children that they would not be afraid. As they grow up in hostile situations, I pray, Lord, that you would protect their little hearts and their souls. That they would not grow up with bitterness or resentment or fear, but rather they would have a holy boldness in Christ. I pray, Lord, for husbands as they have to lead their families in the midst of these horrifying situations. I pray, God, for, again, just strength and courage and wisdom. Pray for pastors and elders that you would give them discernment Give them a sense of courage and conviction that they would lead people towards Christ and not away from Christ. I pray that your word would be sweet to their souls and precious to them. I pray that you would strengthen them in the midst of their trials. We know that you're a God who sees all things and you know each and every situation intimately. And you have chosen sovereignly to keep them in it rather than to take them out of it. And so we trust that your ways are good and your purposes are good. And we'd ask that you, Holy Spirit, would be the comforter that you are. That you'd minister to each of your own in a way that they specifically need. That you'd bind up the brokenhearted. That you would encourage the timid they would strengthen the weak. They would exhort the wayward. You would give each one according to what he needs so that he could look to Christ. Help us, Lord, to be a church that prays for our brothers and sisters. Help us to be a church that encourages each other towards faithfulness. And we pray, God, that in the midst of our trials, you would minister to us as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, these stories like Rebecca's, although foreign to us, are not uncommon around the world. In fact, they're quite common, unfortunately. Reminders to us and to them that this is not our home that we are waiting a day when Christ will return and make all things right, that the world will one day bow before him and acknowledge that we are his and we have been loved by him. But until then, we have daily opportunities to stand fast in the midst of trials and declare that he is worth it. Amen? The suffering in the persecuted church around the world it has its roots back all the way, I mean, as I said, back in Genesis chapter 4, but even in the New Testament, the, the book of Hebrews was written to such a people. The author, whoever he was, wrote to this small group of believers, these Jewish believers, meaning they were Jewish by descent, but they had come to believe in and accept and confess that Jesus was and is the Messiah. Their confession got them kicked out of their synagogues. Their confession and their acknowledgement of Jesus got them isolated from their families, cut off from all that they knew and all that they loved and all that they held dear. And all they had after all of that was each other. They found themselves in a, in a small group of people 
both Jewish and probably Gentile as well, people who have one thing in common, that one thing is Christ. And they found they needed each other more than ever before. At least in Judaism, they were a part of a, a, an organized religion that was accepted in the day, accepted within the Roman Empire. Rome was all about paganism. And at the head of that was Caesar himself. And Caesar was often referred to as Lord, and Caesar was often looked at as someone who could save his people. And then comes along the apostles, declaring to those who are seeking salvation, there is no other name under heaven by which you can be saved, but by the name of Jesus Christ. He is Lord. This fell in direct contrast to the common idea of the day that Caesar was Lord. And so these Christians, isolated from their Jewish heritage, cut off from their Jewish, her Jewish heritage and from their families and from their customs, now find themselves in a sea of chaos. And that's the pressure that they're facing Unlike the people in our day who are being persecuted, they didn't have a long history of Christianity. They didn't have 2,000 years of history and thousands and thousands of books and millions of people that had gone before them. This was very new. And under the threats that they were facing, they were very much tempted to shrink back very much tempted to just retreat altogether and to leave, walk away from Christ, at least vocally. Maybe they thought, as they were tempted in their hearts, maybe we can just believe in him silently and not talk about it anymore. But what they had was each other. And they had pastors like the pastor who wrote the book of Hebrews. And they had the Holy Spirit who the Bible tells us, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And they had the, the letters like the book of Hebrews. And they had the promises of God contained in the scriptures to, to lead them on and to strengthen their faith. And they had more than that. They also had what we're going to see here in Hebrews chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4. So let me read the text, and then we'll jump in. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The people that received this letter for the first time had what you and I have and what every Christian has had since the day that Jesus went back to heaven when he said to his disciples, I will send the Holy Spirit and you can pray to the Father in my name and he will give you anything you ask of him. And the believers from day one after Pentecost found themselves in great need of God's grace on many occasions. This passage in particular talks about the sweet benefit and the, the mercy of God that we can come to him in prayer. Something that we often neglect, but something that is always available to us. The writer at the end of this long argument in chapters three and chapter four, uh, really a warning, warning these people that though they, like the people of old, came through the came out of the, the people of old came out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. Though they made a confession of faith, though they made a profession that they were following Yahweh, when it came time to testing, they were proved to not truly be genuine followers. 
And so he picks up on that idea and he warns these people that if you fall away, you will be just like them. You will prove yourselves and prove to the world that you never truly believed in Jesus. And he warns them, as we were warned over the last few weeks, that to fall away from Christ is ultimately to say you never loved him at all, that you never believed in him. And so the promise, the, the promise of entering his rest, he ends in chapter four. He, he declares that today you can enter that rest. If you find yourself as someone who, as you're being exposed by these warnings, that you're not truly a believer, that you've never truly rested in Jesus, the opportunity still stands. The door is still open. You can still find grace and mercy you can enter God's rest once and for all by faith. But then he comes to the end of this chapter. And then he says this in verse 14, since then, we have a great high priest. He brings up this idea of high priest, and it's not the first time. He's mentioned it in chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. He talked about making purification for sins and what Christ did there in chapter 1. And in chapter 2, verse 17, he says this, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. And so he introduces this idea of Jesus being a high priest. And then he reiterates it in chapter 3, verse 1. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. And now he comes back to the argument. He, he pauses briefly, not very briefly actually, in chapter 3 and 4 to warn us lest we fall away from it. But now he comes back to the argument of Jesus being the high priest. And for us, this is an interesting concept. It's, it's something we've learned about maybe. It's something we've read about. But it's not something we've ever fully experienced. But for this audience, who grew up Jewish, they would have been taught from the earliest ages about the sacrificial system. They would have been taught the Old Testament scriptures and the, the necessity to come to God by way of sacrifices and offerings. They would have been taught about the temple. Many of them would have gone there. They would have been familiar with the temple campus and all the things that take place there and all of the blood that is shed there on a daily basis. And they would have been familiar with the priesthood, knowing that they themselves, not as priests, they could only come so far. And, and God dwells in the center, in the, in the holiest of holy places. And in order to go there, you, you have to come to a priest, and the priest has to complete the journey. The priest has to bring the blood into the presence of God because you couldn't. This all would have been familiar to them. And so when the writer of Hebrews brings up this idea, this concept, this office of a high priest, they would have been very familiar with it. By the way, this was not man's idea. This was not man's doing. Man did not sit around, the Jews did not sit around and think of how they can become worshipers of Yahweh. Yahweh brought them out of Egypt and Yahweh told them on the mountain, this is how you will serve me. So... They tried and failed often, but the standard was established. The way was set. And though day by day throughout the year, there were thousands of sacrifices that were brought to the temple, there was one day, one day each year, Yom Kippur, the, the holy day, when the priest, not just any priest, but the high priest who was chosen for this occasion, would come on behalf of all of the nation, would come on behalf of everyone else, including himself, and he would come by means of blood, and after doing a, a ritual and, and bringing the blood, he would go into the temple complex, and he would pass through the outer courts and into the building proper, into the holy place. And there he would pass through the holy place and he would come to this thick curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And there he would probably fearfully, 
pass through the curtain into the holy of holies with the blood on behalf of the people and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, the place that God had established that these people would come to worship him. All of this was to show them the holiness and the awesomeness of God. Of God. All of this was a daily reminder that they did not have free access into God's presence. It was a very limited access and it was a very privileged thing. The priest would hold, or the high priest would go about his business there. He would sprinkle the blood and he would come out quickly lest he die in God's presence. And so this scene is in the minds of the audience as he says, since then we have a great high priest. There were many men in the succession of high priests who served in that office, but there was never any man who was called a great high priest. This is the author's way of saying this line, this succession of men who served in this role has come to an end. There is one who is greater, the greatest of high priests, the, the ultimate high priest has come. And since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus did not, when he died and resurrected, he did not bring his blood into the temple complex there in Jerusalem. But the writer tells us, and he'll go on for a couple more chapters, talking about what it is Jesus did. But here's what he did. He passed through the heavens the first heavens, that, that firmament around our planet that helps us to breathe. But then the second heavens, that outer space area where all the stars are, into the third heaven, that is God's abode, where the throne of God is. And Jesus passed through all of this until he came into the very presence of God. And he brought with him his own blood. And there he brought his blood before God the Father. And there the blood satisfied the wrath of God towards sinful humanity. On behalf of those who believe. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. That is Jesus meaning his earthly name, that, that name that distinguished him as a boy when his parents were told, when Joseph and Mary were told to name the baby Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus was the name that he grew up with. It's the name that his brothers and sisters called him. It's the name that his cousins called him and that his friends called him as they played games in the street as boys. Jesus was the name that people called on when they needed help with their door as he was, worked as a carpenter. For 30 years, Jesus lived among men on earth as a man, mostly unknown as anything but a carpenter. But then that time came when he made himself known and he was baptized by John and he was taken into the wilderness to be tempted and there he overcame Satan and then he began to preach and to heal and everyone had opportunity to know that he was not just Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, but he was Jesus, the son of God. These two natures bound up in one person, the hypostatic union. How can we make sense of it other than to just acknowledge it and accept it? Two natures not commingled, not mixed with each other, but two distinct separate natures. He is fully man and he is fully God. And that's what the writer of Hebrews has already talked about and acknowledged. In chapter 1, he argued that, G that the Son of God, who came as the embodiment of the Word was greater than the angels. He was equal, he is equal, with God the Father. And then in chapter 2, he argues that Jesus was the ultimate man, that Jesus was the man above every other man, that he was the, the chief among men, that he was the captain, he's the, uh, the hero, so to speak, of all men. 
This great high priest has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and therefore he calls on us as hearers and calls on us this morning as listeners, let us hold fast. Let us not give up. Let us not let loose of our confession. Not the first time he's mentioned confession. Back in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. This confession is ultimately what he keeps driving at. This confession is what distinguishes you from what you used to be, from who you used to be. And it also sets you aside for persecution in a world that does not make the same confession. This confession is that distinguishing mark that identifies you as belonging to Christ. We could ask the question, what what is this confession? Is it a really long doctrinal statement like the Westminster Confession of Faith? Is it something like that? I don't think so. Is it something like our doctrinal statement that you can find on our website? No, not entirely. Similar, but not entirely. That doctrinal statement identifies us as a local church, as a local group of believers that we acknowledge that this is what is taught here and this is what we belong to. But but this is more even basic than that. This confession which defines us as belonging to Christ. And I thought long and hard about what this is because the author doesn't necessarily define this confession. He assumes that this audience understands what he's talking about. Therefore, we have to ask the question, what is this great confession? What is this confession which we are to hold fast, which we are to not let go of, in which Christ serves as our apostle and high priest? I was reminded of Matthew 16. You remember the scene where Jesus is with his disciples, and as they're talking, maybe they're walking along, and he says to them, making conversation, who do people say that I am? It's a good question. In fact, we could ask the same of our neighbors and of our friends. Who do you say Jesus is? And the apostles, the disciples at the time answered, "Uh, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah or one of the prophets. And even then, just months into Jesus' public ministry, people had come to conclusions about him. People had begun to identify who they thought he was. And even then, there were more wrong answers than right answers. How much more in our day? After 2,000 years of people wrestling with the idea and the question of who is Jesus, if you were to Google, I don't recommend it, if you were to Google who is Jesus and filter through all of the answers you would come across, it would take you days And most of them are garbage. Most of them are nonsense. Most of them are just the the imaginations of uh, sinful men. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter opened his mouth and spoke, which is what he often did. And in this case, the words that came out were helped by God And they were correct. Peter says, on behalf of the other disciples, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The Christ, meaning the man sent by God to help us. You are the savior, we could say, the Messiah. You are the man sent by God, the anointed one. And then he goes on with this identity. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. What Peter was saying, without even realizing he was saying it, is this, that you are unique among all men. You are a man with two natures. You have both a human nature and a divine nature. You are born of a woman, and yet you came from God. And we believe And I recognized and realized that is essentially what Hebrews has been saying so far. 
that Jesus is divine in nature, that he is the incarnate word of God, that he is the son of God who comes and embodies truth, speaks on behalf of all the prophets, summarizing in perfect form God's message. And chapter two goes into Who is man? What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him? He speaks now of Jesus' earthly nature, the fact that he was born of a woman, the fact that he grew up in weakness, that he understands struggle. What is this confession that unites us and binds us together as believers? It is this, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And that his Mission and coming and his work that he accomplished was bringing about salvation for everyone who believes. There are a lot of other things that we as Christians disagree on, and I think that's okay. We should keep wrestling with each other on those things. But we will never compromise on this, that Jesus is both man and God. Last week I picked up a a biography on Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers from the late 1800s. And I had heard a lot about Charles Spurgeon. I've read things on him. I've read parts of his sermons and lots of his quotes, but I'd never actually read a whole biography on him. And as I read it, my heart was uh, lifted up to the heavens and brought back down to the valleys as I'm listening to this man's life and all that he did and was used to do, but also all that he went through. He rose to fame by his amazing gift of preaching and the way that God was using him. But this man whom everyone respected, or most people respected, because of God's hand upon him, towards the end of his ministry, was heartbroken by the fact that many of his associates, and even the Baptist Union that he was a part of, abandoned him. Because why? Because he was not willing to say with the liberals of the day that Jesus wasn't really God, that he's not really the son of God, that he didn't really rise from the dead, that he wasn't really born of a virgin, that his miracles were not really miracles, they were just interesting ways to tell a story. Such ideas were taking over biblical scholarship in that day, and guys like Spurgeon said, no, The Bible says what it says, and I believe what it says, and I will not relinquish that. And he was rejected by so-called brothers, who history reveals were not brothers at all, but were wolves in sheep's clothing. This is our confession, brothers and sisters, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Christ, the one sent from heaven to be our Savior In this confession, we have to hold on to, we have to persist in, we cannot let go of it. As I'm thinking about our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world, even this morning, who are facing pressure, who are under the threat of persecution, why? Because they hold fast this confession. In many of these places, the predominant Authority and power in these regions is Islam. And they will give you the opportunity to recant of your Christianity, to leave your Christianity, to set aside Christ, to claim Allah, and to follow him. But those who know Christ cannot do that. And so they're forced to say, I cannot, I cannot recant, I cannot deny my Lord who has purchased me with his own blood. And as a result, they're shot or murdered or whatever. That's their pressure. And we can think to ourselves, living in our land where that's not the common threat of the day, and it hasn't been in our lifetime, that we have it so much easier and better, and in some ways we do. However, the temptation is still there. The command is still there. Let us hold fast our confession. And though it's not the threat of persecution and the danger of the sword, it's the threat of slowly moving away because of things like love of the world. 
Our hearts can grow indifferent living in such luxury in America. Surrounded by blessings, surrounded by so many good things and so much affluence, our hearts can be tempted to just set aside Christ while we pursue some other interests. I mean, after all, I want to accomplish this in life, and I've, I've really grown to love this thing, and I, I want to uh, accomplish this before I die. And so Christ becomes one thing among many things. And if we're not careful, Christ becomes the smallest thing in our week. And if we're not careful, Christ becomes unimportant altogether. The danger of losing our confession is just as much a reality for us as it is for them. In some ways, it's more insidious because it, it comes to us unsuspecting. We know what it is to, or we can imagine, I guess, what it is to be faced by the sword and the fear and the danger of that. But, but when the danger comes to us wrapped in sugar-coated niceness and looking like a blessing, we can eat it without even realizing we're killing ourselves. Let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest, the author goes on to say, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. What does the author go on to do here? He goes on to talk about the nature of this high priest, this high priest who stands as a representative between sinful humanity and a holy God, this high priest who bridges the gap between a holy God who is perfect and awesome and must judge sin and a sinful people who cannot come into the presence of a holy God. We have one, this great high priest who stands on our behalf in the presence of God, who brings his own blood to satisfy the wrath of God on our behalf. Well, what is this high priest like? If you're like me, you assume that these, these guys that serve in these high up positions, they're so untouchable and they're so unreachable and their lives are so perfect and so put together that you would never think to approach them if you yourself had a weakness. But that's not at all what Christ is like. We've all had experiences of people within the Christian community who, whose lives seem so put together and organized and, and just perfect that when you find yourself in need of help, that's the last person in the world you would think to go to because, unfortunately, many times those people appear perfect but they're the last person in the world you would want to share your struggles with because you know what they'll do with them. The author is very much concerned that we as an audience would understand that this great high priest, though he is great and though he is wonderful and though he is standing in the presence of God on our behalf, he is approachable. He understands us. He's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Isn't this what you love about Christ? That when you came to him, he did not cast you off. He did not turn you away. He did not say, you know what? Come back next week once you've got your life cleaned up. We studied through the gospel of Matthew and I was overwhelmed by the amount of times that it says that he was overcome with compassion or he was moved with pity. He looked upon people's broken and sinful conditions. He looked upon the plight of these people and he was moved with pity and compassion. He moved among the people. He didn't shout from a high place and say, I hope you get better. Shortest verse in the Bible packs some of the deepest theology. Jesus wept. John chapter 11 verse 35 Jesus wept there as he stood at the grave of Lazarus, not weeping because Lazarus was dead. He knew he was about to raise him from the dead. He was weeping because he saw Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, weeping. 
And he's weeping because he sees this broken religion surrounding these two ladies, a religion that should be helping them and and strengthening them in this time. And it's become just a, a bunch of nonsense. He sees the brokenness and the hurt, and he weeps. Do you have in your mind a picture of a weeping Jesus? Is Jesus in your mind just someone who is perfect and someone who's like God and someone who I could never relate to because he's, I'm I'm so different than him. The author is wanting us to realize, yes, he does, is like God. Yes, he does go into the presence of God. And yes, you are very different than him. But in this way, he is very much like you. He understands your weakness. He understands what it is to hurt. He understands what it is to cry. He understands what it is to be alone. He knows what it's like to be forsaken. He knows what it's like to go without. And he weeps with us. He sympathizes with us. He recognizes hurt and he's drawn to it. He is one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. What does this even mean? I mean, surely Jesus didn't have an iPhone. Surely Jesus didn't have to deal with traffic and morons on the road. He wasn't tempted in that way, right? Well, no, that's not what it's saying here. It's not saying that, that Jesus was tempted in literally every single way that you have ever been tempted. What he's communicating here is this, that the human experience is the same. Whether you speak a different language or whether you come from a different culture, we are made up of certain desires as humans. And those desires, James tells us, are what lead us into temptation, We want certain things, and when those wants are out of alignment with God's will, that's called temptation. And Jesus had wants. In the wilderness, he had fasted for 40 days, and he wanted some bread. And the enemy came along and said, just make these stones into bread. You remember at the end of his life in the garden, Jesus, there pouring out his heart and pouring out his tears with loud cries to his father in the garden saying, Father, if there's any other way, as he's anticipating just hours later going to a cross, he knows the horrors and the the tragedy of the pain of the cross. But more than that, he understood what he was about to undertake, that he was going to take upon himself the sin of everyone who would ever believe, and that because of that sin, the Father would have to turn away, and that the Father would have to pour out his wrath on the Son. And Jesus knew in that moment in the garden, and he wept before God, and he said, Please, Father, if there's another way, let's go that way instead. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And it wasn't a quick prayer and then it was over. He prayed like that for an hour and then he went back and woke up his disciples. Then he came back and prayed the same way for another hour and then he went and woke them up and then he came back and prayed another hour. Three times pleading with the Lord, urging the Lord, please, Father, please take it away. He understands what it is to be broken and hurt, and he understands what it is to be tempted more so than any of us will ever know. Here's why. When you and I are tempted, the the longer we undergo this temptation, the more severe it gets and the more pressure we feel. But it's eventually all of us give in to temptation, and as soon as we do, it's like it resets. You've given into the temptation, and so your strength is given over. You've given into it. But for Jesus, who for 33 years walked on this earth and never once gave into temptation, the pressure continued to mount, and it continued to get heavier on his back until finally, as I said, he's praying in the garden, Father, please. 
Jesus, because he never gave in to temptation, experienced temptation to a greater severity than any human ever has, yet without sin. In this, we are different than Jesus. He is unlike us in that he is perfect. It's this quality, it's this characteristic that allows him to serve as our high priest, bringing his perfect blood into the presence of God. He's like us in that he sympathizes with our weakness. He doesn't gloat over you in your brokenness. He doesn't look down upon you in your shame. He comes near to you. He binds up the brokenhearted. He sympathizes with the weak, yet he is without sin. Let us then, the author comes to the conclusion of his point, let us then, because of this, because of this high priest who serves before God and serves on our behest, because he is there, because he has done this for us, let us then with confidence, with boldness, with assurance, let us draw near to the throne of grace. What does it mean to draw near? It means to come close. It means we can actually come into that holy of holies, that place where God dwells the place that we were always forbidden to go, we have now access. Let us draw near to the throne of grace. This is a remarkable statement. What is this throne of grace? It's none other than the, the place where God dwells. This is a, a statement that really unpacks the whole gospel because the gospel is this, that there is a God in heaven who is holy and perfect and awesome and he sits on a throne, which means he is sovereign over all things and we on earth are sinful and rebellious towards him. He is the one who made us and we have rebelled against him and because of our rebellion, we stand in opposition. We make ourselves enemies before this God who is awesome and holy and this God who is awesome and holy is a God of judgment and wrath. And he looks upon our sinful condition and he has no other option than to judge us in our sin. And yet, and yet, this holy, awesome, righteous judge who is filled with compassion and pity and love and mercy and grace, determined before the foundation of the world that he would send his own son in our likeness, that he would come and be like us and that he would live a perfect life and therefore be able to come on behalf of man into God's presence with holy blood and that blood would satisfy the wrath of God. And so this throne which to us was only known as a throne of judgment, a throne of condemnation, has been turned into a throne of grace. That's what Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 is saying. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers, that is Jesus, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people, to satisfy the wrath of God for the sins of the people. My sins made me an enemy before God. And my sins were enough to bring upon myself condemnation. The wages of sin is death, the Bible tells us. But Jesus, as he took his blood into the presence of God, God looked upon the blood and by my faith he pardons me. He sees me not in my sin but in Christ. And so there is opened for me and for any who will believe a fountain of grace, a divine giver who loves to give gifts to his children, who is benevolent and kind and gracious and who loves to shower his children with grace. What is grace? It is favor. It is kindness. 
All of us have friends, I hope, who you could call on at any time and say, hey man, I really need a favor right now. Could you help me? I need a, I need a ride to the store, my car, whatever. Da, 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 da. And you can call on your friend and you can ask for a favor and your friend will say, of course, yeah, no problem. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is that we have a friend in heaven. The one who made all things, the one who rules over all things, the one who sustains the universe by the word of his power. And this friend in heaven is to us gracious. And whether we find ourselves at the end of a sword or whether we find ourselves with an abundance of possessions, we are faced with all kinds of pressures and temptations and trials and we can go to God and find favor at the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Two, two things. Receive mercy. I think speaks of that time or should I say those times when we find ourselves in need of God, but for reasons we've brought upon ourselves. As we've wandered into that sin again, or we've allowed ourselves to go down that path again, or we've looked at that thing again, or we've said that thing again to our wife, or, or whatever it is, we've done it again, and we find ourselves again in need of mercy. A God who will forgive us is waiting for you to draw near to him, to the throne of grace, and receive mercy. Sometimes we find ourselves in need of grace to help in time of need. For reasons that we didn't bring upon ourselves, for reasons that maybe just got thrust upon us or we, we found ourselves in a really difficult situation. And we need help, we need wisdom, we need grace, we need uh, discernment to know what to do. We need strength and we need courage to do it. And even in those times, we can come to our Father in heaven who is kind and benevolent and he will give us grace that meets the need. This is absolutely staggering, isn't it? Heaven has been open to us. The throne of God is the place where we get to come by, in prayer. It's been opened by the blood of Christ. It's been made available because of his work. And if you're like me, you don't take advantage of it enough. And as I was praying and meditating on this and thinking through why don't I or why don't we approach the throne of grace with confidence? What is it that's hindering us from approaching the throne of grace with confidence? And here's five reasons. You can jot them down. You can use these to examine yourself when you don't want to pray. Number one, ignorance. Simply put, we don't know we can there are many immature believers who just don't know what they should know. They just haven't had time to learn or they haven't taken the time to learn and they don't know what's available to them. Ignorance. Number two, embarrassment. You know the feeling when you have sinned again and you're tempted to hang your head rather than go through the doors into the holy of holies. Your shame causes you, like Adam and Eve in the garden, to cover up with fig leaves rather than to come into God's presence. This is the way of shame. This is the way of embarrassment. When we sin, which we do, we're afraid to come back to God, which only ultimately communicates we don't really know his kindness and compassion as well as we should. He will not turn you away. He is a God who forgives. And do not let your shame or your embarrassment keep you from coming back to him. I, I know in my own life, and I've talked to numbers of peoples who have found themselves in the same situation where they have sinned, and they're just like hanging their head and wallowing and feeling sorry for themselves and kicking themselves. And man, I... I uh, uh, and the answer is the same. Come to Jesus. 
Come back to Jesus. He is ready. He is willing. He is able to to forgive you and to cleanse you and restore you. So sometimes we don't come before the throne of grace because we're embarrassed or ashamed. Number three, sometimes it's because we're arrogant. And this is one that probably rides under the surface of many of our hearts. When we don't come to God in prayer, ultimately what we're communicating is we don't think we need to, which is one of the most arrogant things we could say. Every day we make decisions. Every day we have to do certain things and be certain places. And when we don't call on God in prayer, when we don't approach his throne of grace with confidence, it's ultimately because we don't think we need to. This is part of the danger of living in an affluent culture. When there's someone standing in front of you with a gun and saying, deny Christ, guess what? You know in that moment, I need Jesus. But when someone is standing in front of you offering you a pay raise, if you'll just do this, it's a lot harder to recognize in that moment, I need Jesus. Because there's a right decision and a wrong decision, and one might lead me away from Christ. Fourthly, indifference. Indifference, what do I mean? We've lost interest. Well, yeah, I I love Jesus, but I love a lot of things. And I have to have time to do other things that I love and that I have responsibilities for. And so Jesus just becomes one thing among many things. And then if we're not careful, he becomes one lesser thing to all these other greater things. And if we allow that pattern to be established, Jesus will become not that important at all. Yeah, I'm planning on going to church on Christmas or on Easter. Yeah, well, yeah, I still, I still am a Christian. We've just grown indifferent. Lastly, number five, reasons we do not approach the throne of grace with confidence selfishness. What I mean is this. You know you should. You know you can. You know you need to. You just don't want to. Because when you're out here living in your own kind of realm and doing your own thing, you feel more autonomous over your decision making. But when you go into the throne of grace and when you're blinded by the light of God's glory and all of yourself is burned away, what you find is that you're doing God's will and not your own. And you know that to be true and so you don't really want to press in. It reminds me of Jonah who knew God was gracious and compassionate. And I knew you were going to save those people, Lord. Sometimes we don't draw near to God because it's more comfortable just doing our own thing, right? The text is clear. The passage is easy. Let us hold fast our confession And let us draw near to the throne of grace to find help. Let's pray. Father, you are great and greatly to be praised. And we thank you that even though you had every right to destroy us, to judge us, you graciously sent a way for us to be saved. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us who believe to hold fast our confession. And we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, even this morning, Lord, as they are facing different pressures than us, that you would strengthen them and help them to hold fast their confession. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us as believers to live in a state of dependence on you, recognizing our need at all times. Help us to be aware of the dangers that we face even when they look like not dangers at all. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.